Greetings ladies and battle gents and welcome to this patch video for uh, There is no epic lucha, only puns, taken from the website Royal Road. In this video we'll be doing chapters 118 to 120 and as always I hope that you enjoy and if you do please consider subscribing to the channel. It would be very much appreciated otherwise we might have to feed you to pick me mushroom tribes. Chapter 118 Hero The door to the surface, the barred path to the interloper. It should have been bent and buckled under the continuous assault. It should have cracked and splintered under their unyielding barrage. It should have crumbled under the hate. Yet the door remained strong, blazing with an accursed symbol, pulsing orange light that seared their sight. The forward vanguard captain eyed the door with uncertainty. I expect that you have a good reason for this hold-up, came the voice of the princess. Her voice, like fingers running through the inside of his skull like a bored spider. Enchanted door, brute force is having little effect, he reported. The sigh of the princess of bone was loud enough that all the marching dead around them rattled with uncertainty. Then use magic or perhaps try one of the various alchemy solutions that our researchers spent many, many years making. The voice pointed out the sweetness that barely hid her annoyance. There was a strange noise like a creaking hatch and the top of the door opened like a flap. Well, I suppose if nothing else, Big Sister will cull the idiots. The bone princess said with intents of five strange things were thrown by winged creatures before the door was rapidly closed. They hit the walls in various places, sticking instead of bouncing. They unfurled into strange hexagon patterns with a sponge cap underneath. It's a mushroom, rattled one of the skeleton. The forward captain would frown if they had any skin left. Are we being insulted, he clacked back. Then the mushroom began to explode with screaming stingers like that of a wasp. They ricocheted from the room and impaled many skeletons, carrying them around as a horrible, burning, bright holy fire leaked at the ends to make them fly. More than a few stingers came to a stop in the evil fresh wall. To cover! The captain roared as his men took protective stance against the shields, walking back behind the fresh wall. The ten-foot walking nightmare congealed skin and muscle that soaked up any attack with ease. The captain felt confident that they would be safe behind him for now. The sound of the hatch opening again and the door made the captain pause. He peered around to see a ball of squishy texture roll to the top before the door. It didn't seem to be doing anything for the moment, but the flesh wall moved forward. Slowly, on its countless toes and fingers, the thing quivered as if in anticipation. A few dark archers smacked dark arrows into it but it didn't have any reaction to being attacked until the flesh wall moved ever so slightly closer. Then it unfurled into a nightmare with a petite little mushroom child in the middle. It cackled and countless barbed thorny spines rose up from the petal base. Hello, boys! This is one coming live from the second floor. The evil child spoke with a voice far too old for its appearance. The form shifted slightly, leaning forward with a smirk. And you can't forget the unforgettable maestro. The voice turned masculine and booming. The vines dived into the soil of the tunnel and began to shake as the creature's left eye became a black void with a deep orange light at right before the deep amber. And this is the beta version of the mic room. They said in sync, Charge! The captain roared as the creature threw out a strange mushroom that looked like a coiled rope as spears of thorny vines tore the flesh wall apart like it was made of pillow stuffing. Sorry boys, you made Delta mad and she's got her favorite kids playing Dungeoneers. You aren't allowed to mess that up. You aren't allowed to make our mother upset. The hybrid roared as the vines began to shear the marrow off the bone warriors. One of the rogue bone warriors threw a flask of bubbling acid that smashed across its torso. The creature looked down at the mess. You know, Dalta worked hard in this, the female voice said without any emotion. The orange left eye blazed. First, you come in rudely knocking, then you come near her with that freaky flesh thing, and now you melt to work, a male voice added. 
The eyes blended together and the burning orange amber. The captain felt his spine tremble. Despite having no nerves to transmit fear through some time, the being looked upon the thorns that grew out of the walls then began to vibrate with a low song. Of all things, a choir of people singing in some sort of deep, ancient language. It pulsed and the captain shook harder. Tell your brat of a princess that we are coming. Your walls, your doors, your dead, your god. They cannot protect you. The mushroom creature warned as it rose up into the throne of thorns. Even a god will become food for the worms and mushrooms. The female voice rasped as the tunnel came alive with thousands of vines, entangling the soldiers and beginning to rip them apart. The last thought the captain had was that perhaps they were not the scariest thing under the earth. Maestro will sing a song and Wyam will grump. It'll be fine, Dalta promised new. The box was silent as they stared around at the creations Dalta had invented. Spider shrooms latched to the faces and injected spores into the lung. That was being shelved because Dalta felt like she wasn't quite ready to unleash that on people, and her true foes were undead with no lungs. Goblin shrooms were just statue-like mushrooms that occasionally farted. They had a strange thing where they occasionally changed facial expressions, but Dalta didn't think that they were dangerous. Dalta did hit upon something strange when she merged her fire and water crystals in the mushrooms, the fire crystal that she had so long ago gotten from the farmer and the water one more recently. Dalta peered down at the mushroom that seemed to be burning and called upon its screen. Mushroom of Fire a mushroom that has obtained pure water elemental energy. This creation can be ingested to force someone to face their sorrows. They will be drowned in regret as they cannot find the world to carry on. Mushrooms that caused one to go on a spirit trip. Delta was making some real good stuff now. So Delta did the only thing that was logical. She birched them. Mushroom of Steam A mushroom that has obtained a rare elemental energy of steam. This creation can be ingested to force someone to purge their impurities from their body. They will cook alive if they cannot purge themselves of toxic substances and become more. Oh god, weak kids, how low chances of being a god with legendary techniques are going to invade me? Delta whined to New. Just reverse merge them. New sounded done with this affair. Delta did so and the result was indeed different. Mushroom of Hot Spring a mushroom that has obtained a rare elemental energy of a hot spring. By soaking this in the water and bathing in it, your body will recover almost supernaturally fast from physical wounds, and innate energies will return sooner. Delta tried mixing them next, both combos ending in the same product. Sauna Shroom A mushroom that grows to be as big as a tree. Inside a unique hot spring can be found. Some may help and heal someone, but others may be trapped and dissolve victims over time. The water mushroom looked like a jellyfish on a stalk, see-through and smooth. Steam shroom looked like a little house with steam poured out of the little chimney, and the hot spring mushroom looked like a basin on top of a boiling water and steamed. The sauna shroom. It was a giant smurse house with a cheerful wooden door that steamed fogging up and sap like glass. It looked inviting, and Darter glared at the words that one might just be decide to eat people. It was something that you think about later. Delta had an undead army to remove the offering free hot spring sauna chips. Wasn't going to do much. Sword shrooms? Delta asked New as she checked up on the various projects. Looks worse than Kemi's staff. You wouldn't want these kids to see them. Delta scratched that off the list. Any of the metal combos? She asked briskly as she stored the elemental shrooms in order. Quite useless, they can't move and they get too big. They seem to crush themselves under their own weight. They also don't reproduce. Delta bit the lip. And that, she asked softly. Lou took some time to float back to a response to her. They have a high compatibility to work better than anything else that we've tried. Delta gripped her hands into her skirts and swallowed once like she was drinking at something bitter. She looked up at the pond in the secret room where the creature slowly crawled out of the sand, grasping and twitching. Am I a bad person for making this? Dalta whispered with doubt. 
Lou moved in closer, and for a moment his screen flickered into a beardy human shape as he seemed to put an arm around her. A frowning young man's face showed before he was just a screen again. No, if you made this for final kicks, you'd be a dungeon, but you made this to protect everyone. The creature looked up and the waves of mushroom caps twitched. Mother, it rasped. Dalta's face squeezed tight with pain and hurt at the word. She stood up and rushed forward, putting her arms around the creature's neck. I'm here, I'm here for you, please, don't hate me. She begged. The creature slowly pulled its arms around her and simply spoke softly. I am ready to protect. It promised. Delta looked up and brushed a lock of sprawling mushroom that grew from almost every inch of its head and back. My hero! She smiled with a watery smile. With that, she stood up and planted a small press of the lips on its forehead. Hero, would you like that as a name? She asked, and the creature slowly smiled. An effort. I get a name, it managed. Delta nodded, beaming despite how her eyes leaked tears. Always, she promised, and the creature stood to its full height, and powerful muscles bulged. Then I will be your hero, he promised, as a sea of mushrooms along with his back wriggled with separate entities. I will be your hero in the dark so that you may shine, he announced and began to walk towards the exit. Maestro knew that in most fights he and Wyam would cream those bone jokers, sharing a body that barely held a smidgen of the most fabulous cells. Not so easy, he had to admit. The Mike Shroom was a transceiver or an empty puppet someone who was hooked into the Shroom network could inhabit. So far, that was Maestro, Wyam, and the Pygmies, if they ever branded Trudy together into that, uh, unified Pygmy god mind hive, mushy, and occasionally Bori of the Grove. Missy was still a bit young to fully use it since she was a new kind of mushroom being. Wyam and he, they made a good couple in terms of battle, but Maestro was not blind. He knew the frozen tree in the north had her heart captured by the truly dashing knight. After all, Maestro was the one who gave Wyam live updates of the fight when the Holy Pot Warriors were consisted of several people against Sir Fran. If they got this far as Wyam, Maestro may have to bring Mother into meeting to make her, um, chill, as a smooth youth would say. She held a grudge. Still, if a group that ever came through that beat Fran but Maestro really didn't like, he'd egg the girl on and whip them with gusto. That was the fun about Wyam. She put on a deep edge about herself, but she was so lonely that she would kill for Delta. Well, they'd all kill for Mother but no one would just come out and say it where Mum worked here. They had all heard the chastising of the pygmies that had gotten when they messed with Jeb in the third-floor kitchen. No one wanted that turned on them. Mother was such a pure person that anything she made, even if it scared her, she matured and made it sure that it was loved. Maestro, he had started out as an aggressive, angsty spitter and matured. Maestro guessed his attitude back then would have scared her, but his most recent transformation, she was all over him in love. To raise a murder-happy mushy into a gentleman, Bob into a human-loving worm, and just wanted to be petted. Kui, who was an enemy, but now turned to a music-loving boy. Delta. Delta did that. Delta was their purpose. Her love for humans became their love. Her wish to protect the children became their wish. Mother's promise that everyone had a good in them sounded almost plausible in the dungeon. Then they called home. So, if this was his real body, Maestro would only feel pride as he began to fall. Only pressure that he was falling in the name of Delta. Only feel a bit of regret that he could not be with her too much longer. The Mike Shroom was heavily damaged with toxic laced arrows and the mage that had a talent in black fire. The embers burned deeply and gave off a sickly scent as if the fire was infecting the flesh it touched. The guard goyles kept throwing the stinger missiles or the occasional jacks, trademarked explosive flasks. It wasn't enough. The army of undead seemed to put itself back together, appear from dust. Truly, 
seem undying. You've got moves, Wyam said begrudgingly. Maestro chuckled and sent a sonic blast into the approaching numbers, turning them to bone dust. The dust flowed like water away from them as the vines reformed into soldiers. Darling, I'm the king of grooves. But these suckers are making me look lame, he complained. Do, um, you have anyone worth fighting for? Wyam asked as she broke apart three more flesh walls and a single spear effort of vines. Maestro knew that she meant someone besides mother, and he paused for a moment. Mushy, my naive brother who guides humans and likes it. He's so clueless he once let a human stab him, basically. Messy, she's a special crossbreed, but my little sister. He panted as he blasted ghostly wraiths away with blue jazz. He thought of someone suddenly. A human, he whispered. She sang with the voice of a goddess and the tones of a demon. She shook my world and we connected beyond love and lust, beyond right and wrong. We became the harmonious duet that made us complete. Maestro perked up and his songs became solid, almost rippling through the undead. You love this human? Wyam panted as she crushed bones under her fury. No, not love. She has her love, but we complete each other in another way. Something primal in the soul, Maestro admitted. Sounds complicated, Wyam mused. Just make sure that she doesn't use you to steal your domain and become a primordial tree. She scowled and slapped down several bone bats. Specific enough, what even is? Maestro was cut off as a series of black arrows pierced his side. The avatar that they inhabited knelt down and a result of the crumbling ability to fight back. A hatch opened up, but they ignored it, hoping it was a stinger missile or more bombs. Any idea of how we can take down these boneheads before we get out with a bang? Maestro panted, really feeling the feedback now. Kill them before they kill us, Wyam announced. Genius! Maestro's voice dripped with sarcasm. Something moved past him and Maestro looked up to see a tall creature with its back to them. It was... Perhaps once a human, all skin and basic human features had been removed to a basic template. The back of his skull and all the way down his spine, like a mane, was a hair gleaming of golden mushrooms. I am here, he promised and turned to show his eyes with deep orange light. No irises, he gave them both a thumbs up. The mushroom-infested moss around the corpse turned and walked calmly towards the undead army. His fist pulled back and smashed through the skeleton warrior, who's unprepared for the attack. From the impact, a ripple of muscles in the taut grey skin moved eerily until the burst of golden mushrooms grew down the skeleton. I am the only human that mother has ever killed consciously. Combined with her hated slimers, with mushrooms added on, the creature announced. The creature stood against the army with a lone turned ally. I am hero. End of chapter. Chapter 119. The Royal We. The squad of ancient guards wielding torn armor and rusty swords stood perfectly still in the dark hallway leading to the inner part of the master's domain. Their weapons had been carefully rusted with artful smithing to inflict plus three tetanus damage to invaders of fortress. The sounds of shuffling feet were approaching and the commander of the squad raised his dragon slaying lance. It was a famous for the time a dragon swallowed an ancestor and choked on the lance without chewing. The whispers of the Princess of Marrow filled their heads. She wasn't speaking to them, to be fair, but as the necromantic lord and the undead army, her thoughts were hard to ignore. Nonverbal mastery of commanding the undead came with some unfortunate side effects, such as broadcasting. The days she had a song stuck in her head were enough to drive them to crack their skulls against the stone for five minutes of peace. I have this handled for the core. She is dangerous, but as a commander, she is greener than the slime that develops on my bone nights. I can take her. The prince's voice came across this petulant and furious. Whom she was speaking to was unknown to the undead minions. They would have to simply accept that it was another priest of the silence, or perhaps the nephew himself. I don't know, Kernak. What does a skeleton tell his roof with? 
his princess asked in with annoyance. Shingle! There was a pause as the whole network tensed. I don't like you, she hissed, and the army shivered with displeasure. The little princess of death did not enjoy undead puns. They irked her something fierce, something that they had learned when a few skeletons resorted to comedy to handle their new existence. The undercurrent of the report came through, the attachment of the zombie priest on the throne room. They had functional eyes and could send funny jokes that they read in books or snapshots of what they saw along the network. Every one of the dead saw the princess surrounded by two mirrors, and a few of them silently groaned. It was the monthly tea time with the princess and her siblings. The princess's face was half rotten and half beautiful. The prim posture shifted as lounged with a smirk. Only via zombies sending their senses could the voice be heard since it had no control over the princess's network of death. Can't take a joke. I was working on that one for like two minutes. The princess complained as she picked her remaining nostril. It shifted and her bony hand smacked on a fleshy one. Don't be disgusting, the princess said with distaste. Her expression dripped from the blank stare at her mirrors. I found it funny. The voice came quite quiet as the princess scoffed at the mirror. First, I find Konak funny if he burps or snores, she chastised. Well, Mera, we gotta find our kick somewhere since you murdered us to use my soul and Tursa's body to become immortal monsters. Konak said calmly at the bony first smashed the right mirror. I warned you not to call me that, the princess said in a deadly tone. We'll never call you by your name. You will never get that honor again. Tursa said the second mirror had just collapsed from the floating spell on its own. There was a silence in the throne room. The princess stared ahead, as if taking a moment to collect herself. The death of two siblings will give a rise to a third. Can no one appreciate poetic symbolism? She demanded, and no one that could be seen. She turned to the staring zombie. Well, are the invaders dead and becoming food for my worms? She asked the priest. The zombie checked quickly. Not quite, he admitted, though missing a lower jaw. A talent that took years to master. Define not quite in a more useful piece of information. The princess waved her hand as if wanting graphs and diagrams. The zombie smoothed down his moth-bitten robe and tried to think about how to put what he was going to say in a more digestible manner. We are slightly boned, he said, and the princess's lips thinned before a massive screen filled the network. The dog skeleton shuddered as the hero released them from his grasp. The necromantic energies were replaced with a network of golden mushrooms. He flexed his hands and he felt his fresh bonds to himself. Unlike Delta, unlike her power, he could not make it this last. The mushrooms were, in the end, neutralizers, energy feeders that would render all that they infected back to an inert stillness. This was its purpose, and he was not something to make or give life. He was here to restore order. His own body was a thin suit hiding a complex system of mushroom threads surrounding a human heart. It beat with a soothing rhythm. That beating noise echoed out in the infected undead that he had converted. Every golden mushroom, including his own mane, beat and echoed with the time with another. The song of life, a proclamation of war. The drums of Delta. He stared at the large hallway with the torn paintings and ruined smashed treasures in display cases. He closed his eyes and offered a prayer to the god that he had, uh, the farmer Dill had worshipped when he was alive. Two left-eyed one, guide me to goodness of this chaotic world. He mumbled and then opened his left eye. May Delta's kindness save them where I can. He finished. He marched as his squad of thirty strong skeletons stepped in time. They drew their aesthetically fitting rusty weapons and clattered as the mushrooms filled the hall with a hot yellowish color. He held the mic shroom close and felt no need to infect it. It was a kin that held two stronger beings than he. I appreciate the marching theme, though. It is perhaps a bit dramatic. Hero said and Maestro stopped the song for a moment. We're marching towards a princess. Imperial march is perfect, darling. One of the voices promised. The other more feminine voice scoffed. Why not? Hi-ho, we're off to cut the wench, she asked sarcastically. Delta would never approve of those lyrics, Maestro responded aghast. Hero had a feeling that he had been ignored for a moment. And some boot and capes walking theme for some man-child that wears a bucket on his head is appropriate. Wyan demanded. It's a helmet to cover his burned and betrayed head. 
His human self hidden. Maestro began with a huff, but it was cut off. He has a cape. He wears a cape besides smug pricks. Wyan fired back. Hero watched as his army began to break down the door that had been barred with iron. Capes can be nice, he tried to offer, but Wyan was on a rat. No, capes. They tangle, they flap in your face, they catch fire and get stuck in a trap. She began to list. Oh, here we go. Maestro sighed almost to himself. Can spread stone curses, can be telekinetically used to choke you, can be animated to betray you, can be out of season, and worn by murdering usurping pricks who take their own power and kingdom. Wang concluded, sounding like she was this close to frothing at the mouth. What if they have little detachable bits? Hero mimicked, touching his shoulders. Acceptable, but it doesn't reduce the jerk levels that they produce because people will assume that you have a collection of them to replace the ones you lose. Capes only work in fairy tales, or with serious cape magic involved, Wyam admitted. The door broke down, and something wielding a staff pointed and let loose a stream of fire into the tunnel. Many skeletons simply collapsed, but Hero walked forward. His skin began to peel and crack, but from those holes, his true form was revealed as his human body turned to ash. The heart protected and connected to the living mane of mushroom hair. He slithered into the crack and latched onto the skeleton, depositing his heart into the mage's ribcage and reforming the human appearance almost instantly. Holy frick on a record. Maestro's voice came from the crack where the hero had left the mushroom behind. I mean, I could do that, but uh, he did make it look effortless. Ewain agreed. Hero flexed his new body and saw the barricades and the wall formations the skeletons had formed to hold them back. He stared as one pointed staff and a sickly green energy was smashed into him. Half of the mushrooms withered and rotted, only for the rest to devour and grow over them in a nauseance of life without end. What was dead would be consumed for the next cycle. What was living would feed the way for the next generation. He frowned at the number of enemies and how his army had picked off easily from arranged fire. The moment the space to cover was immense and the hero had a feeling, the numbers weren't the key here. Hero flexed his hands once and then simply collapsed into a pile of mushrooms and mycelium. Then he consumed the room, his mushrooms exploding into endless splits of lions and creeping life. Whatever they touched was covered in a coat of mushroom heads. His human heart being dragged into the shadow alcove and out of sight as the skeletons were hoisted into the air and broken, looking like grim bird cages protecting the fungi inside. Magic was fired and curses were launched, but whatever was infected was surgically removed and left to perish. Hero was a monster, an existence that could become a plague, a beast that would use all life as a breeding ground. This tenuous cycle gave him a soul, and yet he refused. He was not a beast, mindlessly feasting and piercing innocence existences together like a fleshy tapestry. He was a hero. He was a hero. He focused on the room and was just a room once more. He pulled every spore, inch of flesh, cap, thread, every atom of himself back together with a single thought. Delta expected better. Besides, he was scary if he wished to be sh sure, but Delta could make hundreds of heroes if she wanted to in the years to come. If you were scary, Delta was nightmarish. Rise, my army of little piggies, Delta announced as five little piglets casually sniffed the second floor. One was immediately jumped on by the pygmy and rode into the underbrush. Delta pursed her lips and silently made a spare to bring the her piggies back to five. It was made in the secret garden and then ported to the second floor. A neat workaround for the whole low-making things when people were on the floor rule. The downside was that it worked on cheap items and critters. Trying to teleport a monster over had it, um, smear, to put it lightly. Poor goblin that she hadn't had a chance to name, but she did purposely make it brain dead to avoid harming anything alive. It wasn't splattered like it had hit the ground hard. It was like a coating and the dungeon had just bugged out in its 3D spacing and caused it to spice for the tree, rock, and some ground. It was like a Jeff Goldbroom and that darn fly. Nasty stuff that Delta had repressed with expertise. All right, so, uh, your purpose is to... Delta trailed off as all the piggies, little button eyes focused on her intently. Distract people by being too adorable for words. 
Dada put her hands together as if the business meeting which led her to think about the pickle caps and the little suits and nearly made her inhuman noise. The critters shared a look and then one simply rolled over in the dirt. Okay, maybe Dada should have invested a little more in the brain department. But this was fine. Nothing about these pigs could go wrong. Another one was snatched up by a passing pygmy. Delta silently made another and moved it over. One nibbled on a flower that might have been a magical flower, or Delta beamed. There, this was more like how she liked it. I better check on the kids, she mused, and then had to decide if she meant the kids going the quest, or the kids down below waging biological warfare on the undead. She took off, leaving her adorable piglets to have fun. They'd be fine on their own for some time. The pickle caps sniffed the greenery and began to lightly eat what they went. One found a large fruit and swallowed it whole, ballooning for a moment before it burped. It was still for a moment before it passed gas and relaxed oink, and the pink spore landed on the soil behind it. After a moment, a spore sank into the soil, and the pickles watched it. Oink! Oink! Oh, oh, oink! Tiny little snout pushed itself out of the soil a minute later. The watching cabal of pygmy shrooms all watched with utter delight. Keo was so close, he watched as Kemi's floating head passed into the pulsing air, singing a song that he couldn't hear. It looked like a goat opera by her lip movements. But he licked his lips, the tangy taste of the weird honey still strong. He used his astral tree stumps to move deep into the twisting tower as he was, was supposed to climb. All around him, flying syringes hovered nearby to catch him if he fell. Dio had never minded syringes, but now he definitely liked them. They were so nice, but he had to focus on getting the key. It was right there, like a, like a cookie. He was so close. Grim pursed his lips as Dio clung to the small boulder near the pool. Grim pursed his lips as Dio clung to a small boulder near a pool, upside down and reaching for his shoe that he had lost. He turned to the confused bees. No, I don't think it's a rogue sample. Dio is just super affected by drugs, it turns out, he said with a pinch of his nose. His own vision was slightly blue and his toes felt ticklish. That was the extent of the honey's effect on him and the rest of the group. But Dio? Grim watched as Vass vanished and returned from the climb, soaked in various honey, but holding the key. I'm falling up, Dio said a moment of the mellowest voice Grim had ever heard from the boy. He simply flopped on the ground and hugged himself. I'm a bee now, he said with a profound wisdom before he began to just vibrate on the ground. We could leave him like this for a while, Grim suggested as Kemi moved around with wide eyes. That's rude. Don't be rude. Gotta be honest, gotta be fast. She zoomed past as her robes were cleaning themselves and the last of the yellow honey. Poppy and Amonster were watching all of this with a mellow amusement as they watched their limbs move in the air. Only Vass seemed unaffected. I am lubricated beyond measure, he reported as he handed Grim the key. Give it a minute and you'll get gunked up, Grim said distractedly. There was a rustling in the bushes and everyone stared at the tiny little creature. It walked over, simply enjoying itself, before it walked and fell into the yellow pool that had caused Kemi to become a hyper. What was that? Amonster asked lazily. A pig with a hat, Grim said, confused. The pool exploded and something yellow zoomed past with a loud noise, knocking Grimm's feet out from underneath him, and Dio reached up with an oar and damn blur dragged Dio into the underbrush. The pig with the hat just kidnapped our extremely high DPS. Grimm yelled in a fury as he took off after them. He was quickly outpaced by another blur. He stared as Cammy leapt over the fallen log and was easily pushing through the thicket forest. It was so cute! Her war cry sounded before he lost sight of her and the pig. Delta made a note, put fences around the pools to prevent piggy's exposure. Also, she could be concerned about the bee population were basically becoming a drug cartel with all the natural ingredients. She watched where Dio was being dragged, the honey gluing him to the piggle, who was now gas propelling itself into almost flying. If she was guessing right, he would end up, um... She winced as the pig and Dio went into the pygmy entrance hole to land in the squishy soil at the bottom. This would end well, right? End of chapter Chapter 120 The Great Dio Hero
A prophecy told to people long ago spoke of tall beings, those that came from the outer world. Their very existence made them stand out like a red beetle paint against pale wood. Some tall beings had already long disappeared in the distant past. These most well were occurring in the many tales of the Dark Warrior. Unlike their race, the close-knit community with minor variants, the tall beings came in many extreme shapes. Some had curved jaws like animals, others had fibers in their head and a bright as gold, and some defied comprehension as they donned a truly alien form. Their language seemed to be a crude version, or perhaps an imitation, of the Great Mother's voice. Unlike a soothing, direct connection, the tall ones used harsh words and volumes to transmit their intent. What exactly that intent was would never be clear, but their actions were sufficient to understand the fundamental aspect. They sought to challenge their world, perhaps out of pleasure or due to some instinctive drive. They played the puzzle, somehow impressed the brave Sir Fran, and now some were here once more. Unlike the dark warrior, or the burning gold, or the flowing ice, these tall beings seemed uh, weaker, unrefined to an extent that made the whispers of the prophecy ring louder. The thrum started, merely distracting by the new seeds gifted to them by the Great Mother. Those who would be addressed soon, but the entire grove was gathered in the city. A shuffle of the heralder and the first of them all stepped towards the plateau that overlooked the majority of the city. He waved a hand at the priest, at the tinker, and the fungomancer, and stood guard behind him, his loyal advisers. From his hand, smalls came out in distinct patterns, and it was increasing frequency before abruptly slowing. The language of dead people was not something anyone could learn, but they also admired the way their demigods seemed to be able to converse with the Tall One's language. The King, Bushy, was able to even match the Tall Ones in power and keep them safe. The Dark Whisperer, Maestro, could not be ignored, and if the Tall One stumbled upon the dark dreamlike domain, their escape was not assured. And the Creator Child, Missy, spoke ready, but with great wisdom. The elder spoke of the Great Mother's relic, and how it was vibrating, a hint that the time of the trials was upon them. Their only duty was finally here. The elder waved a hand, and intricate spore patterns revealed that the last testing of the gold fire fibers were complete, as he looked at the priest, who nodded, her own pattern expressing complex ideas and notions. Most didn't quite follow the gestures of the priest to explain how fire was the burning of the air. The priest was the expert of all things magical and mystical, but she also seemed to draw on a hidden wealth of knowledge from the Great Mother. Usually this kind of babble came from the tinker. The priest must have been their cloud and confused spores, because she sighed and simplified her message, her spores making much greater sense to the viewers. She had discovered a way to use the fiber on the tall being of the burning gold to unlock the hidden potential inside themselves. She was able to tap into the network of the mother and saw a path not yet taken by them. The path of the purifiers. The elder nodded before he turned the conversation back to the main topic. The prophecy. The great words that were told to them many, many days ago, passed down by oldest to youngest through spores, taking many hours to spread through the four corners of their people. The words of Great Mother. Only the elder and the priest could quite understand it, and the translation was not quite simple to spore. From above comes a great importance. Outsiders beyond the world arrive with unforeseeable souls. Reflect them like the moon and reflected on water. They will seek the treasure, halt them, but not, but test them so. Kill them not, but slow them so. If they reach the key to the underworld, they must pass because their end is assured. Grieve for them, for they know not their doom. These words were held with great importance. In actuality, what Dalter had told them was this. 
If people come in, treat them like they treat you, and if they get the key after passing your non-lethal tests, just let them go. They're going somewhere far worse. Then she chuckled nervously and left. Many of the deep people had peered inside the sealed chamber. Using their blessed tunnels, they saw the great evil that rested there, the wither. Some scholars debated if it was called the wither or the wine. No one knows since none had dared to get close to the doom, and it had become a taboo to mention the wither outside circles of dulce of bloom powder. A cult dedicated to the dark singer would slyly tell others that their dark god and doom speak like old friends, since the dark singer maestro was quite popular in the cult, were, in truth, dedicated lovers of music who walked around with decorations of a single eye, or paint that matched maestro's dark design. They even tried to mimic using a cane just like the giant singer. The elder raised his hands and public watched in interest as the immortal elder, priest, tinker, and fungal mancer spoke as one, reciting their prophecy once more. No one knew if they were immortal, but in the ten generations of the deep people since their creation, these unique beings had not withered and died, returning to the earth. From above comes a great importance. Outsiders would play. There was a loud thump and a yelp from the tall being that etched through the tunnels that were dedicated to the funneling sound as an early warning system. There was silence as everyone looked at the elder, who was just nodding, a puff of spores and his slightly nervous energy. The prophecy had arrived. Dio licked his lips and felt strong craving for cookies and some fried meat. The ride through the jungle had made his odd mood fade as the strange little pig in his arms, exhausted, was dragged him the whole way. He stood up slowly and winced at the way that his rump felt and he had been dragged across the wild bushes, rocks, herds, and thorns. He had fallen into some hole on the way up and seemed far away, but the image of a soft-looking cave with moss and flowers growing in rings all the way up to the top where sunlight generally filtered down made the place look really nice rather than terrifying. Delta was like that. She made things nice even when she didn't have to. Hello, he called, feeling the vibrations in his throat as he spoke. He went for a gentle and quiet as not to spook anything. He looked down at the cute little pig with a mushroom cap on its head. Hello, I'm Dio. Sorry for making you kidnap me. I wasn't quite myself. He told the thing that seemed to be sniffling at him. He wondered what it sounded like. Was it oinking? It was making some noise as it vibrated in his arms. He felt a slight shake in the ground, and he turned to the source and saw a dark wooden door concealed in the shadows, opening down the middle. It swung towards him and split in two doors. Dio's mouth dropped open as the envoy of little mushroom people walked cautiously out before three groups burst into twirling dancers with long banners weaved through their plant stuff. The group on the left seemed to be waving little flags showing the symbol of black mushrooms and mushrooms with light in them, joining one and light firing into the sky. They danced shyly and away from Dio. The right group were mostly dark mix of purples and elegance. They strode towards Dio with little twigs and bowing and elegant moves, their flags showing blazing eye of the stick. The middle group was the strangest, but at least the best. The little legs carefully shuffled left and right as they hid inside the little jars and pots, making them look like those funny crabs that live in shells. One jar had a flag glued to the pot that showed the crown on the pot. Dio began to clap and applaud, but they weren't done. He gaped as something began to weave around the group. It was like a long sheet of yellow painted mushrooms glued to the back like giant worm mushroom made of gold that, at the very front, a single little mushroom posed with his hands and his hips. It looked really new and some of the paint hadn't dried yet. This was like a surprise event that people stumbled across in dungeons. Grim had told Dio about them. He fished around in his pocket and pulled out a honey-coated coin. He presented it slowly with both hands, and the little heroic mushroom took it slowly in return before it held it up with a squeak and a uh, puff of spores. Dio inhaled slightly, and he felt uh, 
Relic, gift to all, success. Liu blinked back and rubbed his nose so the strange cloud seemed to go right to his head. Mum always told him that he could smell out any flower in the gardens blindfolded. He guessed that that was working against him now. Just like when he was always new when his dad had drink before coming home, or when he could taste when Mum used the cheaper chocolate in her cookies. His senses were top-notch, except for the one that wasn't. But Dio always said that you should appreciate things that you have, and not those you didn't. That's why he loved hugging people when they spoke. He could feel their words. The puffs that were coming faster as he inhaled them seemed really... orange. Trial, come for the maze of doom? It was a many spores and it was slightly confusing, but Dio was smelling words? He focused and tried to make puffing noises with his mouth, and they all looked at Dio for a moment as if waiting. Dio had one eye closed and was puffing his cheeks as he spoke. Hello! He puffed and waited. The priest watched the strange tall being seem to have some sort of inner organ failure. She conveyed the sadness to those closest. He was as puffles expected, but it still was sad to see. But she was gifted with the power of understanding tall beings, somewhat. She walked closer to the elder to listen. Listening with their bodies instead of feeding the emotions tinged in the air with intent via the spores that entered the body was always uncomfortable. She leaned in and the tall being tried to shrink down to make itself less intimidating. A gesture that would go over well as the hidden spear warriors above the flowers would have easier access to the back of his neck if it turned out to be a trick. The young outsider seemed to be saying, Greetings, she quickly told the people. This was they all danced and waved, making the outsider bare his teeth, but also with a nod. She informed her people that he bared his teeth like the great mother, friendly, not threatening. The mothers always shined her love and affection, so her expression was also clear. Not these beings. She winced as the being spoke with such a force that the spore cloud was momentarily disrupted. It deafened them and caused a moment of disconnect that was quickly re-established. The elder looked at her and she sighed. Right. She had been one keen to practice the actual speaking of part of all tall ones. She inhaled and bloomed out in a mighty tone. We, ca we camel, tall being, she said regally. To most, it sounded like a little squeak that should melt most hearts. The tall being didn't react at all. She shared a look with Alda, and he looked puzzled. The priest flushed, and the spall showed I was getting flustered. She had been practicing. The tall being inhaled and looked strange. Having had one hand spoke quickly, the priest stared at him closely. Do not sad, I hear not. It was a terrible translation of the massive speech, but it was the best that she could do. Curiously, she sent a direct puff at the being, usually considered highly rude, as it excluded one's fellow deep ones out of the conversation. She used it now to send a message. Slowly, the being inhaled through the strange little beak mouths. Then he spoke back in his own language. He was clearly now trying to select his words carefully. It was almost like he had experienced talking to someone who didn't understand his language. I consume your song, I hear you. The priest moved closer, transfixed by the talk of the outsider. She puffed and vibrated back. Her language and his. Communications. I am zero. No. The thing had a name itself and it stumbled back in shock as the sounds most likely lined up translation. The tall being was calling himself Hero or something so close to it that even spore talk was making it sound the same. The elder frowned and told her it could be Diro or Neo, but the priest was having none of it. The chances of a being having such a name arriving on the same day as the god of devouring evil was too much coincidence. She turned and spoke to her people. Dia was so happy to be making new friends with these cool little guys. He chuckled as he ushered them into a cool, amazing city that was building to the walls of a large underground chamber. Thank you, thank you, 
He said kindly, as various little mushroom people dropped petals in his path or tried to offer berries for him. They directed him to three carved statues of mushroom people that kind of looked familiar and a false statue above them of the cursing snake of a mushroom looming down in a scary snake. Can I wait here for my team? he asked as the spores were almost dizzying in praise, excitement and something about freeing his heart so he revealed its glory. Ah, that must mean a trial of some sort. The fungal mancer and the tinker shared a look privately using direct puffs to share words. The fungal mancer was sure that they should tell people that the tall being did not simply remove their hearts. Tinker scoffed. The hero wasn't so new that it wasn't sure that it was exactly was, but the priest was going overboard. The tinker knew the best way to build a trap to actually hurt tall beings. Fungal mancer knew how to breed and cultivate both healing and poisonous skills, able to draw on the great mother's knowledge of uh, biology. Diology, the tinkerer corrected, for knowing how to kill tall beings was only reason to know the stuff. The fungalmancer decided not to get into this old argument. The tall being was in danger and great mother would not be pleased, but trying to overthrow the elder and priest would basically incite civil war between believers. Harm not didn't count if the tall being to just pop out his heart like a hero and be fine, but trying to convince people that he would die, it would need proof. Tinker was the most direct. Just get the great mother here to sort it out. Fungal wanted to push him off the ledge, as if that was so easy. They were a group monsters, and their actions only counted as a group, and such division might mean that they won't reach the mother unless they were united. Tinker, again, was direct. Then find someone who wasn't so limited, leave the city, and speak to the frogs, the great sea serpent, the silent ghost, the bees... Fungal was concerned. Their travelling speed and means of communication made it difficult, and the bees might understand, or they'd just spend some precious time trying to explain as a priest removed the being's heart in some misunderstood way of trying to see his real form. So, a plant or a mushroom would be better. The tinker was almost casual when he spoke with back with the answer. The doom who would understand them, Fungal froze and then nodded slowly. The doom would, but would they survive the return? The tinker was rather blunt. Their lives meant little. The life of the outsider which swore not to harm was in danger from their own blind worship. Disappointing the great mother was a fate worse than an unknown earth. Fungal Mansa agreed after a moment. They were quick to move as a wreath of golden flowers was placed in the tall being's head with a great purpose. Unseen by Grimm and the exhausted Kemi, the tunnel opened up and the two pygmy mushrooms rushed off into the jungle on the newly obtained steed of Picklecap. Hero hide the cloud of waning despair and sickly fumes. Some of the ghosts saw malicious energy that slowly moved towards him like a mist. Sets of armor in the hall hissed and melted into pools of silver and rust as it passed by. Physical attacks and corruption would be pointless here, and the thing might actually outpace his own regeneration if it had him at the center of its mass. He flexed his hand as he had time to call upon the system to relay his information to him. Hero, wondering raid boss, conditions have a force identified as an invading army with intent of harming the dungeon core attack the dungeon. This dangerous life form is able to infect and corrupt different strains of life to serve his command and turn wasted resources into the enemy back at the foe. This being was created by a dungeon called Delta with great emotional conflict and deeply wishes for your forgiveness. Known powers include infect a body, infect a body and overtake it for yourself. Alter appearance, appear as a human or another. Infection. Infect a target with spores and have your will overtake theirs. Calamity wave. Give up all pretense of humanity and spread endlessly. Inheritor of Delta's heart. A blessed by Delta, you. He smiled as he reread the last line and rolled his neck. Sorry, pal. Someone's counting on me. He pointed his hand as coils of mushrooms from the main wrapped his arm. They began to slowly light up with a mix of light and black light. 
The deafening peal of the air vaporized sounded out as Hero pushed his hand forward. The ghost shrieked and Hero twisted as he plucked the mushroom off the back and transformed it into a familiar grey mushroom. In the other hand, a mushroom turned dark red and began to burn. He threw both of them, resulting in an explosion, dispersing the ghost back into the ether. He saw metal suits of armor being controlled by more ghosts marching towards him. He grimaced. They had stopped throwing skeletons and zombies at him, and now he had to work with automatons, which aren't exactly corruptible. With a narrowing of his eyes, his entire back turned to cutrot mushrooms. Save for the expedition in the middle, most mushrooms, which burned red, his body shot forward as his heart erupted out of the back in an escape motion, quickly spawning new mushroom tendrils. His whole body exploded against the rushing metal, igniting the tunnel and shaking the entire fortress. Without a body, he changed up his tactics. Eight main tendrils thickened and became the center heart, guarded by eight legs. Focusing on the drain of his energy was immense, and each knee joined one of his new body. A tiny mushroom splitter monster formed. The glaring creatures that once upon a time turned into mushy and maestro all rotated like turrets to target the surviving armors as the sickly green eyes lit up. He scuttled up the walls until he was hanging above them, and his new monsters began to rain down acid on the battle, melting them as he plowed through the remaining resistance. Hero moved down the hall and increased speed as a massive door tried to block his path. The acid seemed to make runes light up and just run off, using protection magic against him now. Wise, but perhaps too late. He looked around and broke down, reforming into a massive boar with large tusks. He charged, and the physical blow shook the door hard and tore open a tiny crack. Hero saw it repair itself and couldn't be too mad. After all, if he was allowed to unfairly regenerate, then he couldn't be mad when others did it. But it did leave him with a slight dilemma. Or did it? He frowned as he hit upon the mushroom blueprint Dalta had used outside testing. He shrugged as he was sure that it would do the trick. Inside the room, the bone commander rattled orders and the mages to keep the spell going. They had to stall the beast as long as they could. One of the mages gave a warning of alarm as the chanting magics became erratic. The door that was a target of many protection, warding, and repairing spells was decimated as something continuously ground it down. A chunk of the door peeled back in a show, a massive maw of mushrooms in the darkness. An unnatural wind sucked the room of contents as it pulled the door apart. The darkness was even consuming the ambient light somehow. Mages were drawn in, magic and airflow and even sound. None escaped the hole in space. The commander slipped and was gone. Hero lowered the tiny black piggle that was attached to his mane into the thin rope and stared down in awe. He held up the pig to his own face and smiled. I am humbled to know that Delta can end even me if she tries. You are something I cannot fight. He nodded and felt better knowing that he was not unstoppable, as arrogant as that sounded. The pig blinked. Oink! It said back. Hero put it under his arm, not wanting to end it so soon. It was good company. Brother was amused. He watched the skeleton bits, parts of the door, and a few other things that were shot into the abyss like cannon fire, raining down on his personal space. He melted down everything for mass. The creature was amusing, but losing mass from his body world to a black hole would cause weight issues down the line. Brother did not fancy being a size zero at the end of the day. A slight tweak and a boom, and it was a wormhole back into the world. He picked up a skull that had yet to be consumed and tapped on it. Black, heavy sphere floated into the air, and Brother held it. Tch, is this bad? he asked aloud. The seed turned slowly the energy almost hissing at his appearance. Yeah, yeah, but you thought you'd be safe from us, idiots. We're trying to save you. Being part of little bro isn't exactly going to be a fun experience, he told the seed. 
The seed from a member of the silence didn't answer since it wasn't actually conscious, nor truly sentient. It was what one would consider a cell of a human or a beast, a mindless little worker. And if these followers were cells, then the leaders of those endurance would be akin to embryos or clots. He crushed the seed and slowly the black powder turned back into inert colorless dust. He focused on the dust shot off into the wood tunnels around him. From one twisted talented mage, four to five average kids would be born. Then again, they could be five amazing kids if genes, luck, and mana got involved. But who really knew? He eyed the tiny ball of blackness that their brother was left behind. From parent to child, a seed reproduced, but it was a needy thing. It wouldn't reproduce if the potential child was weak, and once a healthy and potentially strong child was conceived, the seed infected them and enhanced their potential to fearful levels. If two parents had three children, and two were normal kids, and the third was some strange savant with magical such, then that child had inherited the majority of the child's seed versus the tiny portion of a normal child that had managed to absorb by luck. The siege drove them to constantly seek more challenges, to sharpen their powers, to gather with the other infected over time in groups. Most ended up developing strong skills or talents, or even new fields of knowledge. However, most seeds would be taken by monsters or dungeons over time. The true issue was the pure seeds, the strongness remnants of little brother that don't reproduce so much as jump hosts. These caused people to actually feel the abyss and the space between, to feel him. Those were the nutters who formed cults and ended up being a damn pain. Brother sighed, shaking his head. Silence was only alive for a short while, but his creations were still making a mess. Pure seeds felt his hate and madness. They went insane and wreaked havoc, started up groups and gathered ripe seeds. The whole purpose to slowly create a whole race of powerful infected humans who could be bursting with ripe seeds and when enough seeds ripened, a whole new birth would begin. He sat down with his fishing chair and stared at the large cavern. He closed his eyes and felt his skin breaking as he was mined. He felt that the trees were in the hair being brutally burned or cut for material. He felt pockets of poison seeping into him and making him itch. He felt the damn tree digging deeper and deeper like a parasite. He felt more and more of himself being lost in its shape as the dungeon spread to more land. Soon, maybe not too soon, brother would just vanish. He would not be himself anymore after this original shape was gone. Sister was giving more and more to make more dungeons, establish safe connections to other dimensions where the gods and goddesses could be called upon each connection costing her a moat of her own light. They were both sad candles, giving it all to repent for the fact that they were lonely and just wanted a little brother. He nodded once. If you break it, then you fix it. Running away is kind of dickish, he stretched. Besides, if he did fade, he left a bunch of super critters around the world for people to fight. That should be fun, right? He felt a tug on his fishing line and began to whistle a jolly tune. End of chapter And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.